This slide is an overview of the additions of heteroatomic nucleophiles to ketones and aldehydes. So we previously seen the Wittig reaction and organometallic nucleophiles where nucleophilic carbon is adding to the carbonyl carbon. Now we're going to shift to looking at oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur predominantly as the nucleophilic players in these addition reactions to ketones and aldehydes. And I won't go into detail on all of these reactions just yet, but I do want to point out the different types of nucleophiles that we'll examine. We're going to look first at water and then the closely related alcohol nucleophiles leading to acetals in the case of an alcohol or a hydrate in the case of water. We'll also look at amines, and amines exhibit an interesting dichotomy. Primary amines, which contain one R group linked to the nitrogen, react with ketones and aldehydes to give what are called imines with a CN double bond, while secondary amines with two R groups linked to the amino nitrogen react with ketones and aldehydes to give enamines, which contain a CC double bond linked to a nitrogen group or amino group. Sulfur reacts analogously to oxygen, and so for example, thiols or diphiols as the case may be, react with ketones and aldehydes to give thioacetals, which are structurally analogous to the acetals that we see in the case of an alcohol. So these reactions are hugely important for a variety of reasons. Some of these products are useful in organic synthesis because they can mask the carbonyl group. And so, for example, acetals and thioacetals are part of the strategy of multi-step organic synthesis of complex products. But these have a number of biochemical applications as well. Carbohydrates are a famous and very important example of acetals and hemiacetals. Maillard reactions can involve condensations of amino groups and amino acids with carbonyl groups in carbohydrates in the cooking of food. Biosynthesis of aromatic heterocycles. Where does the heterocycle in NADH come from? These kinds of condensation reactions involving reactions of heteroatomic nucleophiles with ketones and aldehydes are a vital part of those biosynthetic processes. And so these reactions are key. And one thing to note before we leave this slide is that these reactions are qualitatively quite a bit different from additions of organometallic nucleophiles to ketones and aldehydes. In those reactions, the idea was the nucleophile adds, we pop a proton onto the resulting O-, minus, we have an alcohol in hand, and we move on with our lives. Heteroatomic nucleophiles are often not so simple. For example, we often see water being eliminated or lost from the substrate via typically uh, an elimination sort of process. So the carbonyl oxygen actually disappears completely from a lot of these products, and that's because water is kicked off as a leaving group at some point in the reaction mechanism. And we'll see all these mechanisms in great detail in the ensuing videos in this unit. A good nucleophile to start with is water. Water is ubiquitous, and because it's everywhere, we want to think about whether and how it can react with ketones and aldehydes. If you look at water kind of on a basic level, we can think of it as containing H plus and OH minus, right? And the O in H2O is a nucleophile, and the H in H2O is an electrophile or potential acid. And so what can happen is water's oxygen can engage in nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group with the net result after proton transfers of the addition of the elements of water across the CO double bond. So the carbonyl oxygen remains in there, we put a proton on that carbonyl oxygen, and the nucleophilic OH group links up with the carbonyl carbon. This structure is known as a hydrate, and this reaction of water with a ketone or aldehyde is known as hydration. It can occur when we take a ketone or aldehyde and place it in aqueous solution, for example. But the extent to which this occurs depends profoundly on the nature of the carbonyl group, the ketone or aldehyde substrate. Generally, the carbonyl compound is favored over the hydrate. So we can dissolve or mix, for example, acetone with water, and for the most part, the structure will remain acetone. It will not undergo hydration. And a good example of that you can see here is the equilibrium constant for hydration of acetone is only about 10 to the negative third power. So very little hydration of acetone in equilibrium when it's mixed with water. There are two structural features that encourage hydration. One is to remove steric hindrance or steric crowding in the vicinity of the carbonyl group. So sterically unhindered aldehydes, which contain a relatively small H rather than a carbon group linked to the carbonyl carbon, 
tend to have higher extents of hydration at equilibrium. So formaldehyde is actually heavily hydrated when dissolved in water. Acetaldehyde with a CH3 and an H linked to the carbonyl carbon is about 1.0. That's a pretty good benchmark. And if you compare the aldehydes and structurally related ketones, you'll see that generally the aldehydes undergo hydration to a greater extent. Steric hindrance has uh, a big role to play in that. In addition, though, electronic effects in the form of inductive withdrawing and donating effects also influence the extent of hydration. Very electrophilic ketones with electron withdrawing groups linked to the carbonyl carbon or lacking those electron donating alkyl groups tend to go under uh, tend to undergo hydration to a greater extent. A good example from this table is this trichloroacetaldehyde known as chloral. This is uh, hydrated to an even greater extent than acetaldehyde uh, than formaldehyde rather at equilibrium and it's because of the extreme electron withdrawing nature of this trichloromethyl group. So Inductive effects due to electron withdrawing chlorines and fluorines can encourage hydration to occur. Let's talk about the mechanism of hydration now. It won't just go via the nucleophilic addition of water to a neutral ketone or aldehyde because water is not a strong enough nucleophile to do this and that would result in positive and negative charges in the same structure and that's going to be a problematically unstable intermediate. Instead, hydration is catalyzed by acid and base. And as we look at these mechanisms, we're going to see a very important general pattern for acid catalyzed and base catalyzed nucleophilic additions to ketones and aldehydes. And the acid catalyzed paradigm is particularly important. This is very commonly used with oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur nucleophiles. Now, before we get into pushing electrons and carved arrows and all that good stuff, I want to remind us of an important condition on acid-catalyzed reactions. Because the reaction conditions are acidic, the only base, the only anion that can exist under these acidic conditions is the conjugate base of whatever acid is used. Chloride, bromide, sulfate, etc. Alkoxide intermediates, which are very strongly basic, cannot exist under these acidic conditions. This is contrary to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Acid-base equilibrium flies in the face of everything you already know about acid-base equilibrium. These strongly basic intermediates cannot exist in the presence of an acid, HA. And so we can't, for example, just add hydroxide into the carbonyl carbon. The concentration of hydroxide in this acidic solution is negligibly small. Instead, what happens is proton transfer to the carbonyl oxygen from the acid HA. Electron flow like this. This generates a protonated carbonyl intermediate, which is now very electrophilic at the carbonyl carbon. So this can react with water, since all we're doing now is shifting the positive charge from one oxygen to another. And this nucleophilic addition step establishes that key new carbon-oxygen bond, the bond between the nucleophilic oxygen and electrophilic carbonyl carbon that we find in the hydrate. We've also got the conjugate base of the acid around here. I'm just calling that A-. minus. That could be water or some other base in the reaction mixture, basic solvent molecule, for example. And this can remove a proton from water, from the water molecule that just added, essentially, to give us the neutral product here and regenerate the catalyst. So it's important we regenerate the catalyst since this reaction is catalytic in HA, not a full equivalent of HA is used. And I want you to notice the general pattern here. First, we put a proton on the carbonyl substrate, which is the electrophile in the reaction. Then the nucleophile added, and this is what I like to call the business step. And finally, another proton transfer took a proton off of the nucleophile and generated the neutral product and regenerated the catalyst. So there's this general pattern of the proton goes on, the business occurs, and a proton comes off. And this is very typical of acid catalysis, this dance of put a proton on, something happens, the proton falls off. Over and over and over and over again, the catalytic cycle repeats over and over and over and over again. And throughout this mechanism, notice there are no negative charges. The reason there are no negative charges is, well, okay, I take that back. There's one negative charge, the conjugate base of the acid, A-. minus. This is the only base that we're allowed to draw, the only anionic species we're allowed to draw under acidic conditions.
And this all follows from the principles of acid-base equilibrium. So in saying we're not allowed to do this, quote-unquote, it's because it's not reasonable to do so chemically, right? The, the concentration of any bases we might invoke, like O minus, is negatively small under these acidic conditions. Under basic conditions, the situation is now very different. Now the concentration of hydroxide is very high, and hydroxide is a good nucleophile that can add directly to the carbonyl carbon. But here again, under basic conditions, we have an important constraint on what we're allowed to draw. No cations. No cations more acidic than the conjugate acid or the counter ion of the base. So here, for example, OH- came along with a counter ion, probably an alkali metal cation like K plus or Na plus. Any cation that's more acidic than K plus or Na plus is unreasonable to invoke under these basic reaction conditions. And H3O plus is the one that's going to come up most commonly. No H3O plus under these basic conditions. And it's because the concentration of H3O plus is negatively small in this basic solution, right? This follows from principles of acid-base equilibrium. So under basic conditions, the situation is different. This hydroxide nucleophile can add directly to the carbonyl carbon to generate an alkoxide intermediate. And now this alkoxide is reasonable under the basic reaction conditions. We know they're basic because hydroxide is listed here and sodium hydroxide catalyst would be listed over the arrow or something like that in a reaction scheme. At this point, we need to recover the hydroxide catalyst and this can happen via a proton transfer to the alkoxide from water, which was, um, which is floating around as, as a, a solvent molecule, right? And if some other solvent mo uh, molecule is around, that could donate a proton potentially as well. This generates the neutral hydrate products and also regenerates the catalyst as it must. So under base catalyzed conditions, the situation is slightly different. We've got a strong enough nucleophile that it can add directly to the carbonyl carbon. So there's no initial proton transfer necessary. But once that business has happened in the first step, we do need a proton transfer from solvent water to get back the hydroxide catalyst and restart the catalytic cycle. This is very typical of base-catalyzed reactions involving carbonyl groups.